Welcome to Stats and Scheme. I am Sean Sai, joined as always by my good friend Tej Seth. We are into April, which means we can no longer avoid draft season. We're hard at work on our free 2024 Sumer Sports NFL Rookie Draft Guide that you can make sure you get by heading over to sumersports.com slash subscribe. That guide should be in your inbox by the end of this week. And today we're going to talk about 10 things we learned when putting together the guide. And Tej, you know, you're the one who put together so much of that guide. So how are you doing and how are you feeling about the rookie guide? I'm really excited about it. I'm pumped for people to read it. Um, you know, I appreciated you going in on a Sunday and editing some of the things that I was putting together. I I was on working on it on Saturday to get through some of these uh, college basketball games. I needed a second screen while I was watching some of those. So, you know, it was, it was still fun to put together this weekend. And and yeah, I'm, I'm just very excited for, for people to read it in general. And yeah, and, and you know, shout out to you for actually going through and editing some of the stuff I'm writing for these players. And hey, you know, if anyone else finds typos, just you don't have to mention them to me. I'm sure there'll <laughs> be some. Uh, I, I am not perfect, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Tej, Tej, I want to talk about just kind of the structure of the guide overall. So it has eight quarterbacks in it, eight running backs, I think 17 receivers and six tight ends. So no defensive players. Uh, how do those specific players end up getting selected? Yeah, so StatsBomb was was very nice to send us some data that we can use for this draft guide and, and really put together some advanced stats that should be helpful for understanding a lot of these players. The specific players in themselves were mostly selected off uh, the, the consensus big board that comes from Benjamin Robinson's grinding the mock. So, you know, tried to get the top players at each of those positions and then added in a couple uh, extra wide receivers, I think that might be relevant in the overall discussion. And, you know, we, we decided to focus on those four positions because we also wanted to, to wrap this guide up into a super flex consensus big board for all of our dynasty managers that out there. So, you know, I think that these were the positions that are usually talked a lot about during draft season. And then we also wanted to, to add a fancy angle to it, throw in some of our projections and kind of help people with understanding rookies in regards to the, the fantasy drafts that are coming up. You mentioned a bunch there, Tash. Can we just back up? For, so to talk to us a little bit about grinding the mocks and why you think that uh, they're good over there. Grinding the mocks is a fantastic resource to use because it's really the wisdom of the crowds approach. And we talk about this a lot where when one person is giving a singular opinion, uh, a singular prediction on something, um, you know, it's it's very tough to to be accurate about those predictions. You think about when a group of just a, even a couple people can get together they all make individual predictions. And those predictions are averaged together. That's really when you start to get a better calibration on having, uh, you know, more accurate predictions. There's also a really good book about this topic called Super Forecasting that takes people who are really good at predicting world events individually and, and puts them into groups and sees an improvement in that. And there's even a, a great research paper about how someone who is sober individually predicting something is worse as a is worse than a group of drunk people that are that are all trying to predict that same thing so it wasn't with the crowds even evens approach uh you know even works when you have a little bit of alcohol in you as well i think i'm glad Tej, that you can assign all the homework for the class today that's that's a <laughs> uh, really good news and you mentioned uh, tr uh tracking data from stats i was really excited to see some of that some of the metrics like uh like wide receiver separation even like separation when the ball is in the air uh, of course alignments are really helpful like that of course pressure to sack is one that we love was there any specific stat or anything you were just like really happy that we were able to get our hands on thanks to stats bomb yeah i mean you mentioned it separation i think is is awesome and obviously it has to be adjusted a little bit for like the routes you run and uh you know the defenses you're playing the offensive scheme like there's always adjustments to be made for a lot of this data but like just having a pure separation number to really think about like how some of these receivers and tight ends are able to get open down the field and, and what that could mean at the next level was super cool to have uh in, in our draft guide yeah i feel like i'm becoming so much more of like, give me the separation numbers. Like, that's what I want. The contested catch numbers, I feel like, mean a little bit less to me just because of how translatable it is. And I'm really interested to see. I mean, will tracking data <laughs> really ever become super public? Maybe not. But I'm excited to see if we're able to track. Well, this is something that translate from college to pro. And then, Tej, as you mentioned, there's a little bit of a fantasy bend to it. We have fantasy projections for all the players. Is that right? We do have fantasy projections for, for every player in the rookie year. Cool. And then, as you mentioned, the super flex consensus big board will be at the end on that document. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit on the end of this podcast. But Tej, we're going to go through 10 things that we learned, may, may, mainly that you learned and relayed to me. 
Uh, so what is your first takeaway from the 2024 Sumer Sports NFL Rookie Draft Guide? So if you follow a couple analytics people on Twitter, the big thing that everyone's talking about this year is the pressure to sack rate. We have enough years of data to really figure out that your pressure to sack rate in college, which is how often you take a sack, um, you know, when pressured, is pretty predictive of EPA in the NFL. We've only really seen a handful of quarterbacks overcome taking a lot of sacks in college to have productive NFL careers. Um, you know, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson are the two examples that stand out. But when you look at the vast majority of quarterbacks that have succeeded in the NFL, they've all had lower pressure to sack rates, usually between 10 and 17%. And then when you look at a lot of the quarterbacks that have not succeeded, um, you know, like Zach Wilson, Deshaun Kaiser, Tyler Huntley, like they've had very low or sorry, very high pressure to sack rate. So they've not done good in that metric. But this this draft class is going to be a big test for pressure to sack rate because we have consensus number one overall pick, Caleb Williams, who ranks sixth out of the eight quarterbacks that we have in our draft guide in pressure to sack rate. That was something that, you know, he's not great at. He was not great at his last year at USC. We have Jaden Daniels, who is expected to go in the top five, who is eighth in pressure to sack rate. So that's something that could be a weakness for him as well. But we also have Michael Penix and Bo Nix, who are first and second, respectively, and they're expected to go in that next tier, right? So, like, we're, we're about to see how much consensus big board rank versus pressure to sack ratio is, is really going to matter in the grand scheme of things when these players actually play in the NFL. Yeah, of course, it's not an episode of stats and scheme if we don't talk about pressure to sack. Before we dig in a little bit deeper there, I guess it's, it's kind of, or I think it, right, it's necessary, not sufficient, in that if you just have a low pressure to sack, that's not guaranteeing you success, right? Like there are a, a, is a large group of people who had a, a low college pressure to sack number, but that didn't translate to success. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way to put it, right? Like I think, you know, there are some examples of that. Uh, Sam Darnold, Mac Jones, Josh Rosen, like those are quarterbacks that didn't take many sacks in college, but, you know, ended up not having very productive NFL careers. But the, the overall correlation is, is definitely there between the two. Yeah, of course, we've trumpeted the stat uh, a bunch. I, I like it, or I think of, like the entry point for the advanced stats, of course, you have EPA and success rate. And it really does feel like this year, pressure to sack and sack avoidance generally and kind of seeing the quarterback as like the focal controller in the entire system of pressure. It's just been more widespread, which I'd like to see. Uh, and Drake may just even thinking about this is, it's just a really, really interesting test case in a lot of ways. So I think his pressure to sack numbers are really good, right? Yeah, Drake May was third, um, you know, with the third lowest pressure to sack rate. Yeah, and then when you watch him on film, I think it's a common thing that people, oh, you know, he's like drifting in this way or he's kind of like his drop is away from pressure. And Tej, watching a lot of these guys and it feels like in these kind of like air ratey systems, it feels like there's like in a built in inexactness in how the quarterback is dropping, whether they're the, I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I know their specific coaching points because I'm not in those media rooms, but sometimes it feels like a, hey, you know, like, like balls got to come out when he breaks as opposed to like something that really, really impressed me all year this year with CJ Stroud in Houston was that offense is like so, so specific and how drops are tied exactly to the routes of receivers. And like, if you, if on your fifth step, like if this player is not at X amount of yards, like there is going to be a problem. And can you replicate that over and over? But then of course you see some of the things Drake may does and it's hard not to have your, your eyebrows up. Uh, and so with pressure to stack, I guess we will we'll probably end up doing an episode about it. Uh, really talking through it more and more. And as it, it's conditional on you being pressured. So like when I'm thinking about Michael mm -hmm. Penix Jr., I think his number showed up quite well too. And the first thing was like, you know, like he's got a good offensive line, but uh, the stat presupposes a pressure, right? Yeah, I mean, there even is like some people who argue that that pressure rate is a, a quarterback stat, you know, on the NFL level. Like I still think that it's it's more of an, an offensive line uh, stat than maybe some some like, you know, analytics people probably want to say because of just like how much um, convergence there is between the, the quarterback and the offensive line. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it being have it having it being conditional on pressure, I think helps a lot in regards to evaluating what the quarterback does when they're pressured. And you know, I think that Penix and Knicks are also interesting because especially Knicks, Knicks, I think had the best offensive line in the country last year. Um, you know, JJ McCarthy also had a, a top five offensive line. So it's like maybe when their pressures are happening, they just happen to be right before the quarterback was about to release the ball anyway. So context is, is really key for those two. And then I also think it applies to, to Caleb Williams and, and Jaden Daniels a little bit where 
you watch 2022 USC compared to 2023 USC, and you see a, a very different offense that Caleb Williams had to play in. You know, maybe he was playing hero ball, and that's why he was holding on to the ball for a long time. He did have the highest time to throw in this class. Like, I think he was someone that that was trying to create a lot because he knew his defense wasn't going to get be able to, to make many stops. And, and also that he had to, uh, you know, overcome a lot of deficiencies on the offense. I think Jaden Daniels is the same way where he also had a very, very bad defense on the other end. Um, you know, he was probably someone that wanted to hold on to the ball a while to try to hit Malik neighbors or Brian Thomas jr. Downfield, but still when you condition on a pressure, it definitely helps than just normal sack rate. Yeah, the holding the ball point, I think it's interesting because, yeah, there are a lot of times that Caleb Williams extended plays. I will say I think he's really good in, in structure, so I, I don't have, like, huge concerns about that particularly. But, yeah, if you're going to be a person who extends the play, you're obviously your time to throw is going to go up. You're more likely to get pressured. And then there's, to me, when you're watching the film, it's like, all right, well, is this player uh, just, like, looking to take off? Is this player extending the throw where you see a lot of those nice clips uh, from Caleb Williams? All right, that, that's point one. I'll leave that one to the side. Tish, what do you got as your next takeaway? So just kind of mentioned it, but JJ McCarthy's profile is so polarizing. I also talked to, to Sam Brukhouse about this on his show, The Class Play, uh, last week, where JJ McCarthy had the lowest usage rate of any quarterback in this class, but he was good in EPA. He was good in completion percentage over expected. He was good in pressure to sack rate. He was very athletic, um, you know, based on some of his agility numbers at the combine and it might not be his fault that the usage rate was low. Like maybe that's just how the offense was set up. So, you know, I'm not going to ding him too much for that. What I think it does mean for him going forward is it just widens his range of outcomes more than quarterbacks that were used a lot in college, like Michael Penix, like Caleb Williams, like Jake May, where like we, we just have more uncertainty about what JJ McCarthy will look like if he has to drop back 40 times in the NFL game. Yeah. The usage one is it, from like a film watching perspective, it's just like you have to watch so many more games to be able to get kind of a certain amount of clips. And we're, you're doing so much projection uh, at the quarterback position. You're not going to see, hey, this is the exact type of thing that you're going to see on a Sunday. But like there's, you know, further throws, obviously, to the opposite hash uh, in college where it's nice. And I, I just I try to remind myself like the college coach, I assume that they see their job as winning games and not just preparing a player for the NFL. So I try not to get too mad at it, but sometimes you see like three throws a game that are, that are like of worth for your evaluation. And you know, it gets a, it gets a little bit uh, frustrating there. What's your next takeaway uh, from our draft guide? So this, this mostly applies to quarterbacks, but I think just in general as well, I think age is being undervalued in, in public discourse where Drake may is going to be 21 years old. Uh, you know, the day of the draft, like when he's drafted, you know, he's, he's going to turn 22 at some point during the summer. Um, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, they're over 24 years old when they're going to be drafted. And like, I think when Drake May is getting compared to Jane Daniels, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, like he's, he's being evaluated side by side to them without age really being taken into account. And like, there's still so much room for him to grow as a quarterback. He was still so young when he was playing in college relative to some of these, these other quarterbacks in the draft. Uh, so it's like, I think, I think it's getting a lot lost in, in the general context of this is like, yeah, he, he's just such a young prospect right now. And like, that's something that, you know, you kind of want to, um, to, to bank on that you can end up developing him if you're the team that takes him. So for May particularly, right. You that got that 21 year old, uh, on the draft. Is that, that's another example, maybe for you, kind of like how you said McCarthy, there's a, a wider range of outcomes. Is that how you kind of approach May as well? Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think that that also widens the outcomes when you've seen less of what they've looked like at the college level. Like, I do have this theory that if we had a really good classifier that could identify NFL throws, it's just what you just talked about. Where like you see three or four throws a game, where you're like, okay, these are things, these are throws that they can make in the NFL or, or situations that they'll be put in the NFL. Like, the more NFL throws you accumulate in college, the narrower your your range of outcomes would be in the NFL. Um, so like for for quarterbacks like Drake May, JJ McCarthy, we just haven't seen a ton of NFL throws yet. So their, their range of outcomes is probably a little bit wider than some of the other older quarterbacks I talked about. I like that theory. And then you can spend a little time just convincing yourself either way, right? You can, you're, you're trying to buy the tail for one of those guys. So you take, you roll your dice on there. I do think even uh, <laughs> these conversations, I feel like sometimes they're like, oh man, we're talking about a player who's uh, like in free agency. Oh, this player just turned 29. Their career is over. Always makes me sad. <laughs> 
expectation. But in the draft, I guess there is something like with draft careers. We'll probably talk about that next week. But just thinking about even aside from age, well, like has this player kind of maxed out? Like have they already gone through like five college seasons at this point now with uh, being able to get additional years? Like have we already seen this player maximize their potential? And of course, there's going to be certain positions where I think of edge rusher as one, for example. Of course, defense is not in our uh, guide, but players that are a little bit younger and they have the athletic traits where you're projecting out kind of further and further and just draft position in general. I think you, you, you looked at it a little bit, right? It ties to usage a decent bit. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, no, that's true. Like it, it, it does tie to, to usage because I mean, it makes sense, right? Like the, the quarterbacks that have the ball in their hands the most often are probably really good. And, and that also influences their, their draft position. So it's all tied together, but like age is another thing that is like a pretty big indicator of NFL success at quarterback and a, a big indicator of draft position. But that, that goes back to what I just said, where it's like, yeah, the, the quarterbacks that are coming out younger are probably good. And like, that's why they're able to come out younger rather than stay in college yeah, as well. The selection bias. They're probably yeah. important. I mean, quarterback evaluate. It's like such a, uh, for me, I'm not even like, Oh, I want to put out my, like, this is my big board of quarterbacks. This is how I would do it. There's just so much that we don't know that I'm excited to find out this year. Tage, let's move on to the running backs. What was your, uh, one of your takeaways? Uh, from the running backs. So Jonathan Brooks was my favorite running back to watch in all of college football last year out of Texas. And I do think he would have been the RB one in this draft class if it wasn't for his unfortunate injury towards the end of Texas season. When you look at his stats from stats bomb, second in broken tackle rate out of the eight running backs, second in yards after contact, first in yards per out run. So he can really, um, you know, do well when he's a receiving back also. And like, I think he's, he's a very well-rounded back. You know, Texas has had a pedigree of of putting out some pretty talented running backs th- these past couple of years. And I think that he would have been the next one. We don't know what he's going to look like after his injury. You know, I I hope he's able to return to 100 of what he was. But you know, this is some this is a, a big injury, uh, like an ACL tear, where where you just you don't know what it's going to exactly look like afterward. But I do think that he would be the consensus RB one in this draft class if it wasn't for that injury. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be uh, interesting to see how teams kind of handle that specific injury. And on our guide, there's some good data from Stats Bomb where they kind of show you well, which gap the players run through, the A gap, the B gap, or the C gap. I kind of like that looking at that a little bit as seeing, well, what, maybe not exactly what type of runner they are, but I think it tells you a little bit about the offenses they were in as well. What else do you have on some of the running backs in the class? So another running back, uh, you know, regarding injury is, is Blake Corum. And I think that his advanced stats in 2023 really show that his injury took a lot out of him. He ranked either seventh or eighth out of the eight running backs in, in most advanced metrics. You could tell from watching him that he was much more explosive in 2022 than he was last season. Um, you know, he could be healthier in, in 2024. And I think that, you know, a, a team that is is kind of buying a bounce back from him uh, could make that argument justifiable, but it's, it's going to be hard for him to probably maintain that, that 2022 level where he was talked about as someone, you know, that, that was like one of the best running backs in the country, you know, someone that could be uh, in the top 10 of, of Heisman ballot voting. And, you know, you could see that his injury was affecting him a lot last year, um, you know, post that, that, uh, you know, coming back from that. Isn't it? It's just, I feel like kind of fun to mock uh, like Michigan players to the chargers. I feel like it, it's like a convenient, easy thing. Obviously it wouldn't be, or it wouldn't be in the first round. I'd be surprised if it was in, in this specific example. I just feel like that's an easy thing to do. Tash. Well, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that because when you go on like a, a sports book, um, and obviously we don't bet at Sumer, but you know, sometimes I look at the odds just to get a feeling of what it is like, they'll have like, which team is Drake May going to end up, which team is Jane Daniels going to end up like all the top players in the draft. And then they have like, which team is Blake Corum going to end up at? And it's just like chargers plus plus one fifty, And then every other team with like long shot odds. It's like the book knows exactly what it's doing here when it sets that line. <laughs> And I know, as you say, we don't bet. Do you, you had some uh, a zero dollar bet going on with your dad related to Blake Farm? <laughs> I do have a, a bet with him. Um, you know, I took Donovan Edwards, who was who was Michigan's backup running back. Um, you know, I, I actually played tennis at, at Donovan Edwards High School once while while he was practicing right next to his school. I, I said that Donovan Edwards was going to be hot, drafted higher than Blake Corum. I both thought that when we made this bet last year. I assume that they would both be in this year's draft. And Donovan Edwards was someone who who talked about was talked about before this year's draft as someone who could be involved in like the RB1, RB2 conversation. Obviously did not have a good year. He's going back to college. 
Um, so hoping I can I can still roll that bet over and Donovan Edwards can end up be taken higher than Blake Corum in next year's draft. I mean, now we have like a two year delayed bet. I was going to say, oh, if your dad <laughs> won the bet, then he could host the show or something like that. Obviously, a lawyer <laughs> listener uh, to stats and team. I know that. But I mean, maybe we'll, we'll have to wait till next year. Let's move on to the receivers where most of the fun is at. Tage, what do you have kind of leading off there? I mean, yeah, this receiver class is so much fun. And what I think is, is like really exciting about it is there's so many types of receivers. So you have your downfield threats, Roma Dunze, Jermaine Burden, A.D. Mitchell. You have your elite separators. So that's that's Ricky Pearsall from Florida, Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, and, and Lad McConkey from Georgia. You have your your, your yards after catch monsters, um, Xavier Worthy, Malachi Corley, who's from Western Kentucky. And then there's also some production kings like Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Troy Franklin. So it's like whatever a team's internal draft models or, or big board or team needs, like whatever you're looking for in receiver, if you want that specific uh, type of receiver in this class, I think that you'll be able to go out and get them just because there's so many types of them. I think receiver is going to be such a storyline in this draft for good reason. There's so much talent at the top. Obviously, you know, teams are just 11 personnel teams. You're going to have an extra receiver. That's going to take so many snaps on the field. It just like is always strikes me. Well, how do teams want to build their receiver rooms? And I don't know if you have like an idea. I'm trying to think, well, what is your ideal uh, room? Or like, how would you really build? It? I guess you you obviously you want to have like one star. I keep thinking of the Chase Higgins Boyd trio, which of course that's uh, relatively recent and so recent, but still like that might not even look the same this year where you're, you know, you're going to have a star that's able to win in so many different ways on the outside. You have just a ball winner that can win at the catch point. Then you have someone that can kind of work underneath and then but there's the contractual aspects that are tough where like i love that the vikings drafted jordan addison last year where you bring in that rookie where you know that you're going to pay on uh, justin jefferson so able to have a rookie there is a really good thing and then you're still able to have kind of like a mid-level contributor a little bit uh for the vikings of course with tj hawkinson through that trade and then in this draft like what are the bills going to do are the 49ers going to add someone if they decide to move off of debo or Ayuk in any sort of way even the Seahawks and the Bears are both teams that are interesting to me where the Seahawks, like, of course, yeah, they just drafted JSN, but Lockett maybe getting a little bit older. What are they going to do with Metcalf? And the Bears, of course, they have uh, DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, but do they want to add another person? I'm sure if it was your decision, Tage, you would just trade back from nine as many times as you can for there. Uh, and then thing, just closing up on different receiving rooms, like the Lions are a fun one too because their stud is Amon Ross St. Brown, who is an inside-out worker. He's not, you know, gonna he plays obviously different than jamar chase for example so and of course they have sam laporta there so do they add a third uh, i'm sure you'd love to see that as well what's uh kind of your next point on the receivers here yeah well actually can i touch on on the point that you just talked about where it's like i think you bring up a really interesting point and i kind of see like pass catchers as, as like a three-body problem where you have these these three pass catchers um, that you want to have, you want to have three reliable pass catchers. And then like their, their, the, how much they're getting paid is kind of like how much gravity, gravity they have for your roster, where if you have three pass catchers that are all getting paid, you know, high end at their position, um, deals where it's like, you know, you, like you talk about the bears, for example, where the bears can't go out and have another veteran receiver come in and pay them high end money. Like they probably do have to draft a, a receiver eventually just to get, uh, a, to, to flush it again with, with a rookie receiver, um, you know, in, in their rotation. And you talk about the Vikings, which I think is a really good point. Like they would not have been able to go out and trade for DJ Moore or, or Keenan Allen, um, you know, some of these receivers that have, that have been traded for or signed like a Calvin really, like they had to know that they were going to extend Justin Jefferson. So they, they could pull off the, the Jordan Addison, um, you know, draft pick and then kind of go from there where you have this receiver that's about to get the highest paid wide receiver or about to become the, the, the highest paid wide receiver in the NFL. And then you also have Addison on a rookie contract cost controlled for five years, um, you know, if you pick up the fifth year option. So I think that's like a, a very good point to bring up about evaluating these these receivers. Because you started off by uh, mentioning the three-body problem, obviously a show on Netflix that both of us are watching, no free ads. How many episodes are you into the show? I am four episodes into the show okay. right now. All right. I feel like you did a little bit of a dis one I'd recommend it. Everyone watch it. Let us know. Like, is wide receiver a three, three body problem? I would argue no, because the whole point is like, you don't know what the path of motion is going to be when you have the three bodies moving in space. Like, you know, that receiver is going to be a problem when you have to pay one, like the Higgins one feels like it's almost an inevitability, but you know, we'll let your TV brain and your podcast brain 
uh, falling over into each other. We'll just we'll look past that one for now, Tish. Well, let's get get to the next one. Talk to me about your next point uh, on receivers. So the other thing I learned from this draft guide is I'm really curious to see what teams do with athletic receivers that weren't necessarily productive in college. So you have Adani Mitchell, um, 95th percentile athleticism, but he ranks 16th out of the 16 receivers that we have in yards per out run. You have Devontae Walker, who had 97th percentile athleticism at the combine, 13th in yards per out run. And then you have Brian Thomas Jr., which is this is a little bit more of a stretch, but 93rd percentile athleticism. He was 15th in, in target share. Um, you know, I, I'm in the mindset that targets are earned, but he's, he's playing with Malik neighbors. So it's like, you know, obviously you're, you're going to be the, the wide receiver too. You could see a corollary maybe between Jamar Chase and, and Justin Jefferson, but like, you know, that, that third receiver is, is Terrence was Terrence Marshall Jr. On, on 2019 LSU. That guy got left out. So at least Brian Thomas made the top two, but I'm really focusing on, on AD Mitchell and Tez Walker for this, where they're very, very athletic but they weren't that productive in college. So I'm, you know, I'm, I, I wonder how teams will treat that profile when they take them, um, you know, either on day one or day two. Yeah. Always brings a smile mentioning 2019 at LSU. There's just obviously something in the water at LSU and these types of receivers, like so many people have been burned by them. So I think that makes it kind of a, a dangerous uh, feel. I will say that it does feel like there's just different types of receivers that are able to succeed in the NFL. Now, like if you can't, if you just like cannot beat press one, like it's not just the press man league all the time. I think third down, you'll see cover one rates go up, but teams on offense are going to get into more of those stacks and bunches. Uh, you think of different skill sets that are able to succeed. Of course, like the dolphins having Waddle and Hill, which are like one of one skill sets. I don't think you're like, you're just not going to see Tyree Hill walking uh, to the league, but they're just, you're able to have different groups of receivers that are able to succeed. Do you have anything else on that one? Tish? Yeah. So, I was wondering from your perspective, like when you think about building a receiver room, do you like to put multiple receivers in there that play with a similar style? Or do you like to try to get different styles of receivers um, to, to kind of like beat defenses that way? Great question. Uh, I, if I was to just choose, uh, I would choose like, like different skill sets. I think let's say for the Eagles, for example, get AJ Brown, Devontae Smith. I think I'm like just super high on Devontae Smith this year. I think that Kellen Moore is going to use him a little bit more like like CD Lamb, work them more in the slot. And you just have AJ Brown that's absolutely able to kill you one on one on the outside. To me, if it's just a yeah, I don't know. I, I don't like the idea of hey, we have not that you can't have overlapping skill sets, particularly in the Waddle and Hill example. Like that is, I think, like a one of one situation. But to me, it's like, well, do we have a man beater? Do we have a player that's really comfortable against zone? Do we have someone that's able to stretch the field? And to me, that means okay, well, I can't find all of those things in one receiver all the time. But if I can find a role player that you can like run straight and deal with these safeties, like you're able to play a role in the offense, you're not going to have to take up so many snaps. So I like the idea of having different, uh, just complementary skill sets. And I, I just love now, like the Lions thinking of like your best receiver is really like a slot inside guy and how teams kind of deal with that and build around it. And obviously, you know, they would love to see Jameson Williams uh, kind of take the jump this year. Do you have a feeling either way? Do you kind of side with me on the like, Let's have the kind of a, a sprinkle of everything there. I, I think I do agree with you where you want to have those, those different receivers, especially like I think about it when I do matchup analysis, like, yeah, this receiver is, is really good against press. This receiver is not good against press. And like, you can expect a big game from, from the receiver that's good against press. And you can apply those same concepts to, to zone and man and, you know, the different types of styles that, that defenses play. But like, if I, if I were to play devil's advocate, I think that, when you think about the way that defenses are constructed, like maybe they have the the corners or the defensive backs that can match up on each individual type of receiver. And there's a finite amount of receivers that can guard, um, you know, someone like, or, or both Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell in, in, in man coverage, let's say. And so like, if you just had Tyree Kill and a different type of receiver, you could stick that speedy, uh, corner on Tyree Kill, you could stick the the other corner that's better suited for the other receiver. Whereas if you have two of those those speed guys, like maybe you you put your second corner that you don't feel comfortable having on that that second type of receiver or the the same type of receiver at the second level. I mean, Tish, does the devil need an advocate? I would argue maybe not, but that is a very <laughs> good point. Uh, like because the way that receiver rooms are built, of course, then you have defensive rooms that are built that same way. Where 
Like I just keep on valuing or valuing the slot cornerback more and more because we keep seeing the, I mean, Boyd is an example. Now that he's the best person in the NFL, I just think of the Bengals examples an easy one to see the three different players. But yeah, you have like that F kind of move player where they're, you know, running option routes in the slot. Like if you're, if the defense is optimizing to face that, then, you know, yeah, I look at you taste, just finding edges. Let's just build them on stars. I uh, build them all the same way and just kind of, kind of press the button as much as you can. What do you have else? Uh, or what else do you have for the receivers from the draft guide? Yeah. So, so last point about the receivers is I think there's a lot of value in, in getting a tier one receiver. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about, you know, waiting on those tier two receivers and, and going to tier three. You know, I, I think that there is value in jumping to, to tier three and kind of avoiding tier two um, just because I'm not super confident in, in that, that second tier vastly outperforming the third tier. So what I mean by this is when you look at the expected draft position, there's a clear top three, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze. I think all of them are going to go in the top 10 and whatever teams end up drafting them are obviously going to be very, very excited to add a, a true uh, potential number one wide receiver to their offense. You look at tier two. So this is later in the first round, um, you know, picks like 16 through 32. Ryan Thomas Jr. and A.D. Mitchell are, are kind of sitting there. We talked about their athletic profiles. Like it makes sense why teams want to draft them. But I think I would really wait on not taking those guys if I was a team looking for wide receiver and would really load up on, on receiver in the, the second round. And in that tier three, if I could, you're talking about Lad McConkey, Xavier Worthy, Keon Coleman, Troy Franklin. Like I think that if you're getting 80, 90% of the tier two receivers from tier three, that's a, a very good value uh, that, that you'd be getting from that position just because there's so many receivers in this draft class. You could even take multiple shots on receiver, um, you know, in the, in the second, third round, if you want to, just because it, it runs that deep. And I'd really focus on a position that's more scarce in the first round after the top three receivers are gone. Yeah, it always feels like there's like inflation in the draft is going to mess with positions in some way. Of course, at quarterback, uh, we're going to see we are going to see it this year. It feels like we see it every single year and we'll continue to see it. I, it does feel like that will apply a little bit to receivers here. And then it's, you know, in, like when is the run on receivers going to be? Obviously, last year, I think we saw it pretty clearly uh, towards that back part of the or like the middle of the back part of the first round. Like once it starts, then it feels like everyone kind of jumps on board. And then I think of a team like the Panthers, who right there, I think they picked 33, like they don't have a first round pick. Uh, they certainly could use a receiver like, well, how did they deal with it? And then at that point is, well, what receiver is going to be there? Is it going to be so many players that are drafted in the first round that are receivers that you're just kind of moving down your board? Tish, why don't let's take it to tight ends for I think we're at uh, point nine here. Yeah, so one point about tight ends is Ben Sinat from Kansas State. I think has a, a decent argument to be tight end two in this class when you look at his stats bomb data, when you look at his athleticism. So, you know, assuming Brock Bowers is, is the tight end one, which he is going to go top, top, you know, 20, at least maybe top 10. Um, you know, I think that when you work down from there, there's a, a group of three tight ends that all could make an argument for that, that second tight end spot. Jatavian Sanders from Texas is one of those. He has the production, but I don't think he, he tested that well at the combine. There's Theo Johnson from Penn State who has the athleticism, but he does not have the production. You know, you're talking about someone who had around 20 receiving yards per game in college. Ben Sinat from Kansas State has both. He tested really well at the combine, and he also had a lot of production in college. He's someone who lined up in the backfield and, and could play that fullback role, uh, you know, lined up in line and could even line up out wide. So he has a lot of positional versatility there. Like, I think he's someone that could be a really exciting prospect uh, for a lot of these teams. And, you know, my, we, we've talked about this before, but like drafting athletic tight ends on day two has worked out well historically. And I think that he could be the next one that works out. All right, Benson, I would a little, a little flag plant there. I like that. Yeah, I think we'll, maybe next week we'll talk a little bit about I uh, will do the top 10 tight ends conversation. I do think it's an interesting topic, obviously in this specific year with Brock Bowers. What do you want to finish off here on points with the draft guide? So I've seen this discussed a little bit on Twitter, um, but I, you know, this draft guide kind of looking at the data and some of how, some of how like the consensus big board stack up. Like, I think this, this confirmed that there's a, there's probably going to be a, a little bit of a drop off after pick eight in your dynasty drafts. Um, you know, especially the, the super flex leagues, you know, you have your top four quarterbacks, Williams, May, Daniels, and McCarthy. You have your top three receivers, uh, Harrison, Neighbors, Adunze, and then you have your your top tight end and Bowers. I think after that, after pick eight, 
Um, you know, you're, you're starting to get into that second tier of receivers. You're, you know, starting to take some of the running backs that won't have a ton of draft capital behind them. So they, they probably won't have much of a, a expected rushing share their first year in first two years in the league. So I think that if you can, you know, make some trades to, to make sure that you have top eight pick or, or to make sure to hold on to those, if you have them already, like that should be pretty beneficial for you going forward. All right, we've given the people the 10 points. Now we can transition to, it's like, I know the best thing to listen to is when people talk about uh, their respective fantasy football leagues. But I think this is a little bit in context to your Tej. Let's talk about your dynasty league. Uh, again, if people that don't know Tej, like Mr. Tradeback always, like collect resources. Uh, so I know we talked a little bit about your dynasty league last year. It felt like you were tanking, trying to get uh, that one-on-one. What pick did you end up? And then kind of talk to us kind of like where you lean, maybe the holes in your roster and kind of, your strategy a little bit also <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, Tej, before you even go like i'm sure that uh, some of the people that you play with listen so you know if you want to give a little smoke screen pull a little uh maybe whatever minnesota's doing uh with with their spot you know feel free to <laughs> let's see if i can uh yeah let's see if i can confuse them enough where they don't know if this is a pure smoke screen or you know i'm, I'm wanting them to think this is a smoke screen but yeah i mean i, I was tanking last year in dynasty i traded away uh throughout the season i traded away jared goff um, DeAndre Swift, T Higgins, a couple other players. So I ended up with, with five first round picks, uh, you know, which I was really excited about, but I didn't tank enough because I ended up with the the third pick in the draft. So I somehow I didn't even get one of the top two. Um, so, so maybe we should have done a little bit more trades, but the, the holes on my roster are very evident. Um, you know, I, I don't have, uh, so, so like I've, I've three studs, I think Lamar Jackson at, at quarterback, uh, Amon Ross St. Brown at, at wide receiver, and then TJ Hawkinson, once he comes back from injury at tight end. So I really need running backs. So, you know, I'm really going to focus on taking running backs in the second round of the dynasty draft this year. But like, I'm really excited about that one Oh three pick and, and seeing how the draft board falls and, and who I can get from that. How did that tank feel? Like, do you think that Swift Goff and Higgins were just like, Oh man, like, my matter. It's so easy for us to tank on on paper, but you know, you sat through the year. Did did you just like look look to the hope on the horizon? That that's what got you through it. <laughs> it was it was kind of funny. I mean, you think about uh, like when they showed uh, Monty Osenfort's reaction when the the Cardinals like messed around and beat the Eagles, and like you could see he was thinking about how his draft pick was going to fall. Like that's how I felt about my team sometimes. Where it's like I'm like, you guys better lose today. Like I, I want one of these top draft picks. Obviously, they they won a couple games down the stretch, which. uh which pushed me out of the top two picks. I mean, getting crossed off general manager lists <laughs> left. <and right. laughs> Anything else to talk about uh, in your dynasty league, or we can get, get to wrapping up. Yeah, we can, we can wrap up here. That's, that's so all. I do want to finish off. Tage, we got team. the 2024 Ohio state sports analytics conference that you'll be at in person. And then Eric eager will be virtual. You can go at OSU underscore S a a on Twitter. I think there's a zoom registration. Uh, as well you're looking forward to it or you're just gonna like tell everyone hey you know i graduated from michigan like i kind of run the place here or why don't you talk to us about it a little bit yeah i mean i, I am very excited for it I, I went last year um and i saw eric do a, a panel um which was which was really cool and there's also a lot of other interesting panels that are upcoming this year so it's like an in-person event on saturday it's it's always great to go to those and, and see people um, you know, that I either have only communicated with on, on Twitter before and end up actually meeting them in person or just just people uh, like like McKenna Hack, who, who interned for us this past summer and, and kind of see her uh, in Columbus again, which will be really nice. But yeah, I'm doing a, I'm doing a panel with Amelia Propes from PFF and then Maya Pin, uh, who works for the NFL. So it, it should be fun to, to talk football analytics with them. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, hopefully everyone will be very cordial. <laughs> for for me and, and Arjun driving down from Michigan. I'm sure I'm sure they will be. Uh yeah, I think that, that's good. That's looking forward to. I look, I think I watched some of the videos from last year and they were pretty sweet. And some of the poster presentations were really good. So I think that's gonna be uh good for a lot of people. But that's all we got today. Let's get out of here. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Stats and Scheme. Visit sumersports.com. Go to sumersports.com slash subscribe. Make sure you get your rookie guide coming out later this week. Follow us on Twitter and YouTube at Sumer Sports. Leave a nice rating if you choose to. Uh, next week, we'll continue talking about a bunch of topics related to the draft. Most importantly, enjoy the rest of your week, and we will see you next time.